Good morning, everyone. It's lovely to see you all today. Can I just do some practical info before we start with the streaming? So number one, you all need to know this is being streamed, right? In the event of something unpleasant, like a fire, please follow your Lord Up team. They will be the ones who stay calm, so just follow them and I'll lead you to safety. Um, if you're wondering where the loos are, they are to your left. So just carry on down the corridor, you'll find them to your left and you'll find water and coffee on your right. Those are your basics. <laughs> we're going to start with a film and we'll let you know as soon as the show is on the road but from all of us a very very warm welcome before we start thank you for coming are we ready to go Dear friends, a very warm welcome to Nora's seminar on family planning in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Thank you. We extend a special welcome to State Secretary Yoke Sonsha and our team from Chile University. The objective of today's seminar is to commemorate the upcoming World Contraception Day, which falls on September 26th. That's next Tuesday. We hope that all of you will share your knowledge, insights, and engage in discussions on opportunities and challenges in this field. Our agenda includes an address from political leadership, while Tulane University will provide insight into the Promise Programme in DRC. Following this, we have a wee session with collective dialogue with a kickoff started by a small panel of distinguished guests. As we end, as we near the end of our programme, we will invite you to see the land and the networking. It is my great pleasure to invite State Secretary Bjorg Sancha from the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs for the welcome speech. The State is your State Secretary. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> Switch this. It is on. Yes. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you. Great to see you all here together to talk about an issue that is very, very close to my heart and I think the heart of many people in the room. 
and a special welcome to our colleagues from the DRC. The last time we met <laughs> was in a, a very early morning at the International Conference of Family Planning in Pattaya in Thailand, just under a year ago, to talk about a program that is very important for Norway and a very important collaboration between Norway and the, uh, and the DRC. In an area, sexual and reproductive health and rights, which is a top priority for the Norwegian government in our development cooperation with the rest of the world. And this has been a top priority for a very long time for Norway, across changing governments. And that is something that I think is a, a strength, really, in um, our political landscape, that whatever, uh, whoever is in power, we always keep women's rights and sexual and reproductive health and rights top of our agenda. Uh, I was asked to talk about demographic dividend, <laughs> as our HR in the DRC, uh, something I will very happily do. It may be a little bit of a nerdy topic, but I think it's very, very important. And looking around the room, I see people who know a lot about this as well, so I look forward to the conversation that we will be having in uh, a little bit. But let me also just draw your attention to, many of you be, may be familiar with this document already, but just to show how important this is to us as a Norwegian government, um, together with NORAD, we've produced guidelines for sexual and, sexual and reproductive health and rights, SRHR, which is available to all our embassies, it's available online, it's available to all our partners, on how we work practically through <laughs> financial support, political support, and how we think about sexual reproductive health and rights. Uh, and I thought I would start there today, because in the history of family planning, to use that, that term, and in the history of uh, the environmental movement, there have been um, programs <coughs> and uh, uh, that have, that have um, challenged human rights. And as we move into the 30-year anniversary of the Population Conference in Cairo in 94, I keep going back to the discussions at the Population Conference in Cairo and what a watershed moment that was for how we think about reproductive rights and how important that is for the work that we are doing now. And many of you know I was at the Population Conference in Cairo as a youth delegate for an NGO <laughs> and I learned a lot. It was incredibly impressive to be at different NGO uh, side meetings and panels and listen to women from Brazil and from, from India, from other parts of the world who talked about human rights violations in the name of population control. Remember at that time we talked about population explosion, world's carrying capacity. We had too many people. We need to limit the number of people and some governments used draconian measures to limit the number of people. And so it was necessary, and the, the discussions in 94 really brought us to that place where we think about reproductive rights and meeting unmet need for uh, and, and bodily autonomy, control over our own bodies, and gender equality as a goal in itself. Um, and I've gone back to Gru Brundtland's speech in Cairo many times recently. I really recommend everyone to go back and read it. It's, it's really, uh, it, it brings some of those thoughts together around how to think about the Earth's carrying capacity, how to think about environment, environmental issues, uh, in the context of population and reproductive, uh, reproductive health and reproductive rights, uh, gender equality. So I, I thought I would just quote a couple of paragraphs from, from Gro's speech. And remember, this is 29 years ago, when she, towards the end of her speech, um, she says, population growth is one of the most serious obstacles to world prosperity and sustainable development. I'm not sure I would have phrased it like that today, but that's what she said. <laughs> we may soon be facing new famine, mass migration, destabilization, and even armed struggle as peoples compete for ever more scarce land and water resources. In the more developed countries, the fortunate children of new generations may delay their confrontation with the imminent environmental crisis, but today's newborns will be facing the ultimate collapse 
a vital resource basis. Uh, in order to achieve a sustainable balance between the number of people and the amount of natural resources that can be consumed, both the peoples of the industrialized countries and the rich in the South have a special obligation to reduce their ecological impact. Changes are needed in the North and the South, but these changes will not happen unless they stand the test of democracy. Only when people have the right to take part in the shaping of society by participating in de democratic political processes will changes be politically sustainable. Only then can we fulfill the hopes and aspirations of generations yet unborn. It's really powerful. And in the 29 years that have passed, our thinking has evolved around what does sexually productive health and rights mean? And how can we, how can we uh, think about population, uh, about bodily autonomy, about gender equality, about rights, about population development, uh, and about economic development? Um, I've spent some time working on this on the African continent, and these issues can be quite sensitive. Um, but yet very, very important. And that's where the, the concept of the demographic dividend has become a, a political aim. So the African Union in 2012 or 13 put the demographic dividend as, as a, a, an aim for countries to strive towards, also happening in the, in the DRC. And I think it's a very interesting way to think about linking population development um, and economic development. And I was asked to talk a little bit about it. I know there will be some, some I think, more, more information about what it means in a bit, so I won't bore you with, with all of that. But the African Union, because we need political leadership, I think Rose's speech was very, very clear on that. The African Union has made this, which means all of all African countries, have made the demographic dividend a goal, setting up some quite clear actions that countries need to take, including uh, providing sexual reproductive health services, to see if we can get to that space where you have uh, cohorts of young people entering a labor market, which actually has jobs that can help power economic development, like we have seen in some countries of uh, Southeast Asia, and that we may, it might be interesting to see if we can be recreated in the African context. And so in the DRC, the SAFI program, which has been, Norway has been supporting now for about 10 years, I think, looking at the expertise here, 10 years? No, four years. The coffee is more. Yes. Coffee, eight years. Eight years, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so a while, we have some experiences. We have some experiences, we have some some uh, context to, to what we're doing. And it was quite interesting in the context of a program which is really about environment, climate, forests, that the DRC government, as I understand, came and said, well, what we need, what we would like, is to have reproductive health services. That's what we need in the context of, of uh, this program. And this good collaboration between Norway and uh, DRC with good partners in civil society and Tulane uh, University to help provide services. And again, this more holistic thinking about, um, about reproductive rights, bodily autonomy, and good old family planning has been important. Um, and there's the PROMI program as part, as part of this, which again, financing uh, financing procurement and distribution, again, of, of contraceptive commodities, bringing it to clinics, making it available to, uh, to people who need it. And we'll hear more about that later, and I, I really um, look forward to that. Because if, if we are to realize reproductive rights, sexual reproductive health and rights, there are a number of, we, we need information and services and people's ability to make sound choices around their own or our own reproductive uh, reproductive health. And these programs help 
provide that spaces. You need the products. The programs help make the products available to people who otherwise would not have them, the contraceptives. Uh, but the, also the information and the ability to actually access products and, and use them. So what we've seen, uh, again, in, in an, an African context, there may be a number of barriers to use of contraceptives. And it was very interesting to me to look at some data a few years ago that said that lack of access is actually now the least of the barriers in the African context to use. But um, uh, partners' resistance and own <coughs> beliefs about side effects, many of them may be incorrect, are a great barrier to access. So making sure the products are available, but the information is available so that people can make those informed choices that impact their own uh, reproductive health and, and families is important. And what we've seen, we saw the film from, from DRC, um, and we've seen the statistics also from, from DRC that there still is some way to go to make, make these uh, services, the information and the ability to make those choices uh, available, but doesn't make it any less important. And that's why Norway is committed to and engaged in uh, working with our partners to make these uh, this more <coughs> available. Um, so I think I'll stop there so that we can listen to partners. Um, we look forward to hearing from you and to have a good discussion around very important questions for, for all of us here, including the Norwegian government. Thank you. Thank you so much, State Secretary, for sharing those insightful reflections, both on the history and on leading up to the factors of what it takes to reach sustainable development. I realised when I started, though, I didn't say who I was, and it's not like I'm the donor for my generation, but I expect people to know that. So I'm just going to add very briefly that my name is Ruti Gadal, and I have the great pleasure of leading our section on gender equality in work. So let me just park that there, and let me get back to what really matters. Um, one of the things that the State Secretary made very clear is the importance of political leadership and priorities over time. And Norway has an, an important role and an important priority on this. That's been unequivocal across political or partisan lines. Now, it gives me immense pleasure to move over from the political leadership part of the program to Tulane University and to welcome this distinguished team that has flown from France to take the stage and we'll just be so sorry. I'm going to be introducing our partners who consist of Shane Bertrand, who is Professor of Department of Health Policy and Management at Tulane, Julie Hernandez, Associate Professor of the same department, and Arsen Binanga, Director for Family Planning Programs at Tulane University. So with that, I would like to wish the presenters to come on stage for this presentation. everyone. Let me start by saying what a pleasure it was to hear the introductory remarks from someone who I already know is in the weeds on this topic of family planning, so uh, that was great. Let me also say that back home at Tulane University, I teach international family planning, and I, in a very, not abstract way, but I talk about Norway and the leadership that it, among a handful of countries, plays in international family planning. So it is truly a thrill to be here today at NORAD and uh, talking with you on the topic of family planning in the DRC, where it's a privilege to us to receive funding uh, through this source. The video gave you a bit of a look at the DRC. What a great, uh, we were thrilled to see Dr. Frank Akamba, who is one of our lead staff, 
the guy who talked in the film. So whoever did that film, he chose a great guy. Uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, the DRC is the third largest, uh, has the third largest population of any sub-Saharan country. Yes, it has low carbon emissions per capita, but the population, as Frank mentioned, is already at one million and is looking to double by the year 2050. On average, women have over six children. There's a large gap between the urban and rural areas. Uh, in terms of poverty, DRC rates 176 out of 187 on the Human Development Index, and 96% of the population are living on uh, under $2.15 per person a day. The infrastructure of the country is greatly deteriorated over decades of mismanagement and uh, lack of resources which relates directly to the very fragile government situation in the DRC. For those of us in the family planning business, we talk, uh, our main indicator for assessing how, where a country is in terms of family planning is the percentage of women that use a modern contraceptive method, known in the business as modern contraceptive prevalence, or MCPR. And what's encouraging to us about working in family planning in the DRC right now is that the experience of the international family planning field is that on the left hand side you have the very low presence countries where it's really there has yet to be any activity to get things off the ground once you hit about 15 percent you begin the sweet spot where it becomes easier because there are a handful of women that are out there using contraception there are services and you're more likely to benefit from the effects of um, this rising tendency to use. The DRC is just above the 15% cutoff point, uh, which makes us, uh, encourages us. It's also useful to recognize that while modern contraceptive prevalence uh, is measured at a given point in time, it does relate to uh, the total fertility rate of a country. That is to say, as modern contraceptive prevalence increases, the total fertility rate uh, over time will decrease. And if you look at the high prevalence countries on the right-hand side, notably all in Eastern and Southern Africa, the uh, total fertility rate in these countries runs from about 2.8 to 3.9 children. So yes, uh, MCPR does link directly to uh, fertility. <coughs> It is a long-term process, but there is that strong demonstrated relationship. How does family planning align with the sustainable development goals? It addresses numerous uh, of the different goals. Uh, birth spacing, the, the use of contraceptives allows one to uh, birth space, allowing better child nutrition. Women are more likely to be able to participate in the workforce allowing more investment in productive uh, activity, reduced maternal mortality, which is a major theme of the, develop of the government of the DRC in its motivation for family planning. With contraceptive use, less girls are dropping out of school, and very important on the gender equality uh, front, the idea that women are empowered to have some control over their own fertility, which is a game changer in terms of their lifetime course. Uh, these leading, leading to poverty reduction uh, and again, directly into climate action. Family planning does align with the priorities of the government in the DRC. Uh, the first letter of intention was signed between Kathy and the DRC in 2016. Uh, this led to the first phase of PROMI, which has run from 2019 and will through December 2023, three-year project plus one-year extension. Second letter of intention was signed in November 2021. The current government is very strong on promoting free education and girls' education, and certainly there is a tie-in between uh, family planning and the, uh, this emphasis on education. Similarly, the efforts toward universal health care, which are under discussion in DRC, as in the vast majority of countries, uh, <clears throat> the president has made an, uh, an initiative of free deliveries at hospitals, which was recently launched. 
And there again, there's a link with how many babies are going to be born. Can you sustain this kind of an, an, an initiative? For those of us that live in the family planning world, we're very familiar with FP 2020 as a major global movement behind family planning. Uh, when we hit 2020, it became 20, FP 2030. And the government of the DRC has uh, now repeatedly pledged specific uh, goals to achieve vis-a-vis -vis its commitment to family planning, um, such as procuring of contraceptives. The uh, two strategic plans provide a roadmap for those of us that work in family planning, uh, thus aligning our activities with different points within the strategic plans. One that ran from 2014 to 2020 that Dr. Arsene Binanga had a major role in directing a second between 20 and 20, 21 to 25. The demographic dividend. Uh, part two of the discussion this morning of the demographic dividend. How many of you have already run into the demographic dividend in your own life, in your own work? Okay, good. Um, the four steps here are actually from the National Strategic Development Plan of the DRC, indicating the government's interest in viewing its own progress in the context of the demographic dividend, where they are currently starting as a low-income country. <coughs> what happened? Um, you seem to be rushing toward Korea, but <laughs> rush back to the DRC. Thank you. Uh, and, and the desire of the country to progress through this, to become an emerging country, and by 50-50 to become a uh, high-income country. How does this happen? Why are governments believing that there is that there's a connection between uh, family planning and this demo and this process? Julie. We <laughs> Population structure. This is where family planning comes in. When an increasingly large percentage of women are using a modern contraceptive method, this will lead to a, a reduction in the number of young people as a proportion of the total society. This pushes more people into the productive age groups of 15 to, 40, uh, to 65 where they can be contributing directly to the development of the country and not draining off the resources of the country. Um, so this is the first step in the demographic, uh, de demographic dividend. It cannot operate, family planning alone cannot bring this result. It must operate, as the State Secretary indicated, in connection with, with health, with good governance, with improved education with job, the economy and jobs for these young people that are coming into this world. But this, it's this working together, these multiple factors that can lead to the demographic dividend. And we have, finally, Korea. Uh, we, uh, Korea is an excellent example. It is not the only example. There are uh, numerous other countries that have also experienced this. It's hard to believe that in 65, 70, the birth rate of Korea was actually higher than the birth rate in the DRC, but you can see from the orange line that it very rapidly decreased uh, over a de period of about um, five, six decades. In contrast to the DRC, which has started at six children and has actually uh, edged up a little more than that. The result of this is in the middle graph. When you look at what is the ratio of the number of workers to the number of dependents. And whereas we see a fairly straight line for green, the DRC, we can see how in the Korea example, the number of workers is much high, double the number of dependents in this. In the Korean case, it was estimated that some one third of the uh, growth in Korea's uh, economy was attributed to the demographic dividend. This is aspirational. The DRC is not on the cusp of realizing this, and true of other governments, yet it is the angle of family planning that probably most speaks to governments in terms of achieving what they would like to, um, what they aspire to achieve. And with this, I'll pass this along to my colleague. Hello. Bonjour. Bonjour. <laughs> so I'm gonna present, give you an overview of the Promise Project, which is funded by Papi.
when you look at um, who is in this project, you see that the project is funded by CAFI, managing country by uh, FONAI, together with uh, the Minister of Health. Then we see from the blue to the bottom, they are implementing organizations. Inops is uh, playing the federal agents, and also is involved in uh, construction of a uh, warehouse for products. UNFP is in uh, this consortium to be providing with uh, water centers. Then you have uh, today DKT, real stop organization that are involved in the implementation of this project for the first four years. Then for the second phase, we plan already to have two national organizations joining this consortium. The objective was, of PROMIS is very simple and clear. We want to increase the volume of contraceptive method to be offered to women. And this program is based on uh, voluntary choice, is uh, also targeting an indicator called couple years protection. This means, in short, the quantity of, it's tracking the quantity of contraceptive given to women to avoid them to get pregnant. And when you look at this project, vis-a-vis -vis to what is uh, what is do what is has been done in Congo in terms of family planning, this project will contribute to the increase of uh, modern contraceptive prevalence in uh, the province that this project has targeted. Congo has uh, twenty six provinces, and this project is working only on eleven in eleven provinces. So the project was uh, built with uh, multi-channel strategies. It is mainly community-based distribution. Most of the program of family planning pro program in Congo, they are working through phase, uh, through health facilities. But this one is mainly community-based distribution. <coughs> in uh, this project also, we have been able to work with uh, DKT, who is very, very known as a good player in uh, social marketing. And also, we have been working also with uh, Melista, who is uh, very good in uh, working with uh, public facilities. It is very important to know that uh, Congo is a country where we have two situations. One is women, uh, uh, people need services plus products. When you put product and services, women will go there. In some part of the country, you need to do also demand creation. Because sometimes they don't know if uh, the services will work well. Sometimes there are some women who need to be convinced on the benefits of family planning. It is also important, based on what Jen says, to keep in mind that the health system needs to be strengthened. It is very fragile. In Congo, when you talk to authorities, let's say Minister of Health or Governor, about funding family, uh, funding health, we easily say these things belong to our partners, donors. Go and talk to donors. Then this project also tried to do some operational research by using funds from other 
organization like Parker, Gates, and Char. We are benefiting from this research to improve what we are doing with, uh, in this uh, project. As I said, we are operating in 11 provinces. So the 11 provinces are in uh, green. Then you see in green, we have sometimes some triangle in red. The triangle represents where Kathy is working, where uh, uh, provinces with uh, forests. But when we start discussing this project, we have been asking to mainly target the eight provinces with uh, red triangles. Then we start discussing with uh, everyone, government, donors. Uh, first, what is the objective of this project? For the donors, it will be very easy. I want you to produce more CIPs. And you say, OK. From the government, they say, we want you to go everywhere. Let me step back and say, the coverage of family planning services in DRC is very low. The access to family planning is very limited. There are some parts of the country where there is no family planning services. Then we say if you need more CIPs, you have also to target very populate cities. This is the reason why we have sometimes Congo and hard. We have Kinshasa. Kinshasa is about 14 million only. And this is the reason why also <coughs> we have uh, South Kivu. So I can say the other provinces. Then we had also some discussion with uh, uh, Minister of Health, who was asking us to go to work and work in province to which it, it belongs to. For example, one of the ministers say, can you go to Chapa? Then he say, no, it is not possible. But we made a choice. We are good on government, donors, and I, and uh, all implementing organizations to work in uh, those 11 provinces. Thank you. Good morning. Bonjour. Bonjour. Uh, thanks for having us. So just quickly presenting three key results from uh, phase one of, of POMI. Uh, the first one is the expansion of FP service availability. It is true that in many countries um, access is no longer an issue. In the RC it very much still is, uh, as Arsen mentioned. And through that project we've been able to extend FP service coverage to 152 out of 517 um, health zones in the country in 11 provinces. Uh, we've also trained more than 13,000 providers, including 10,000 uh, community-based providers. Uh, and a lot of those providers are those young students that you saw in the movie. And you could tell that they were quite young, right? Nursing school is a secondary level. So all of those, we say kids, because they're 15, 16, 17 year old. And uh, not only are they going to become nurses, not only are they going to become part of the workforce, and continue using that family planning training, but there are also young people who can talk to other young people about family planning, and we think that's one of the great benefits of uh, the way this program is structured. Um, having those young people who have a medical background has also enabled us to increase the range of methods available at the community level, including the very much sought after uh, AMPLON, which is the main method uh, in the DRC. Uh, and having a wider range of methods available obviously participates uh, into increased quality of care, increased choices for women who can uh, pick the method that's best suited for them. Uh, another, uh, probably the one that interests our donor the most, uh, is that uh, through this project we've designed a highly effective CYP uh, production mechanism. So Arsene mentioned couple year protection. Think about it as one woman or a couple being protected from an unwanted pregnancy for about a year. Uh, and uh, true for me, we've been able to, as of the end of phase one, so the first three years, um, to deliver 
more than 5 million CYPs, which is way above our targets. Uh, what is also very encouraging is that throughout the year, so we started in December 2019, which was not a great way to get anything started anywhere, uh, but we struggled a little bit through our first year, but you see that throughout the years, the volume of CYPs that we are capable of producing every year uh, constantly increases. So that's, we see this as, as very, very encouraging, and how we can refine that process to produce even more is obviously uh, the next uh, phase of reflection for our team. Um, Another uh, interesting fact, perhaps, uh, we conducted an analysis for 2022, which is a year where we had excellent data, both uh, in the DHIS2 and in our own program. And uh, if you look at the bottom of this slide, uh, in 2022, 41% of all CYP delivered in the DRC was delivered through the PROMI projects. Uh, so that's uh, an incredibly important role, obviously, that we uh, uh, play in terms of uh, making contraception available and, and uh, seeing it go to uh, the women we're trying to reach. Uh, what is even better perhaps for us uh, is that, I don't know if the imitation is the highest form of flattery, but uh, other donors uh, adopted this model because it is so effective as a service delivery mechanism at the community level. Uh, and it started a little bit, uh, so CAFI obviously uh, adopted the model, which we had already piloted and tested and replicated in two provinces uh, in 2019, and that's the first big expansion, which you see on the provinces that are currently in green. Um, USA in 2020, a little bit timidly, started with five of uh, the nursing schools. They, they used in the same way to lend us in Kinshasa. And then in 2022, expanded to further provinces, which are the ones you see in stripy blue. Uh, and the World Bank in 2022 as well has adopted this model and expanded it to, to new provinces. So uh, obviously a good indicator of its effectiveness and its efficiency as well from the point of view of other donors. Uh, of course, no, no projects is without challenges. Uh, we've listed a few here. We could be talking about many more. Uh, one of them is that we receive continuous demands from the government for additional activity and support. Um, as was mentioned earlier, this is a country with a very fragile governance, fragile health systems that needs a lot of support. Uh, and so we are often asked to add uh, as part of inti institutional support or as part of health system strengthening. And some of, the, some of those demands uh, make a lot of sense in the context of POMI, for example, the, the building of medical warehouse, which help us with our supply chain, so that is something that has been included in the project. Uh, other are being discussed and will be discussed as we launch into phase two. Um, there is a very important, uh, I touched upon that, uh, it's very important to um, factor in health system strengthening, uh, as a component towards the sustainability of the project, uh, because we said it's very efficient, very effective, uh, but if we don't have uh, buy-in, if we don't have appropriation by the government, uh, we might be uh, limiting any hope for the sustainability of the project uh, as, we, as we move along the years. Uh, another issue uh, for, for us has been chronic contraceptive shortages which is don't let anyone tell you that women in the DRC don't want contraception, because every time you will put one on the table, it will disappear. Uh, but to some extent, the, the project has been a uh, victim of its success. Uh, it's not just us, USAID, in their own adoption of the model, has the same issue. Uh, and uh, we, are, uh, we have some uh, ongoing efforts to try to mobilize additional resources so that we can uh, purchase more contraceptive, bring more contraceptive into the project, and maximize uh, the impact of, of that model that we have under POMI. Uh, and finally, not everything can be sustained. Um, the DRC is still a country that's heavily donor dependent. Uh, they are still funding gaps, and uh, we are still, all of us, working to, to address them. But this being said, um, it is true that the DRC, it is well known that the DRC doesn't involve, uh, invest heavily in its own health system, uh, that the health sector is very donor dependent and being a little bit shortchanged by the government. But if you look at this slide, uh, it could also uh, do better in terms of uh, bilateral and uh, private donors. Um, if you, we, we have that image of the DRC being extremely donor dependent, 
But if you compare it to other countries uh, in West Africa, for example, and you look at what the uh, amount of money they receive per capita, it's not that high, and it's actually lower than in other countries where uh, the government doesn't invest a ton either. So uh, I we wanted to let you I'll leave you on that last slide as a perhaps a starting point for our conversation. Thank you very much. to start. That was amazing. Did you think that when you were listening to them? That's a very short presentation. You've managed capture it. You've managed to simplify. And what I'm left with is uh, an incredibly complex picture that you've simplified and you've put all the bits and pieces together from chronic shortages to governance to funding, sustainability. The best explanation I've heard is the demographic dividend. Thank you. Thank you. That's a very good explanation of companies' protection because that's one that I've always had problems getting my head around. So thank you. Wow. Okay, so while I take that uh, and process that in my head as, as time passes, what I do want to say is, and I know you all have questions, but we thought we'd try and do a little icebreaker and start with some warm-up questions. And with that, I'd like to invite a couple of you to come and talk to us. I, we may just rearrange the, the, the seating. And sit, Secretary, I'm so delighted to have you. Oh, thank you so much, sorry. I'm so delighted to have you on our panel. Georges from Care Norway, please come up to the stage. Kim Stalinon from the Ministry of Climate and Environment in Norway. And, sorry, Julie will be joining us as well. You look surprised, I hope you are not. <laughs> I'm going to put you on the spot with a really hard question. Please do join us. And for the rest of you who are in the audience and also online, please send in your questions and hold on to your hats. You will have opportunities to comment and ask your questions too. And that's where I'm going to stop because my French is absolutely frightful. <laughs> but one does like to um, try. Let me start with care. So not caring, but care, the organisation. What are your priorities? How is your team able to work across the development, peace, humanitarian nexus, or are you still continuing the humanitarian? Can we start with that, please? Yes. Yeah, um, yeah, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I'm working for Kia Norway. We are supporting, uh, we are supporting the DRC program uh, with the support of uh, Norway government. We have a program called uh, GWEP, Gender Equality and Women Empowerment which is quite popular in many countries in Africa and uh, Asia. Um, mostly is a program which is multi-sectoral. Um, on your question, especially as a representative, uh, DRC have been a, a country affected for many years with war. Uh, they are in post-conflict, it's still fragile. So you cannot work with development if you don't think about humanitarian. Currently, the uh, humanitarian uh, response plan from uh, OCHA is showing that uh, this year in 23, we have around uh, about 6 million of IDPs. We have around 2 million of uh, returning. So uh, we have also some refugees. And uh, then you can understand how much is mostly they are located in Ituri, in Kivu, in South Kivu, and a few in Kasai. So you can understand that no one can work on humanitarian and expecting a sustainability if really you don't work with this we call Nexus, which is mostly combining the development and humanitarian and peace building. So our approach as Care Norway, what we do is mostly to try to say yes, it's a, a program which is a, a development oriented, but at the same time, we have also to address those IDPs needs. And mostly for humanitarian, we focus mostly on food security. This is a huge in uh, DRC. I think there is around 26 million 
according to water, which are ready in uh, urgent need of acute uh, uh, food security issue. So we, in uh, humanitarian, we mostly we are focusing on that need to make sure that uh, um, uh, women of house family, household, uh, have something to put in mouth. So at the same time also, on peace, we have a kind of, we have our community approach. We are mostly, we are meeting some local leaders, and meeting the community traditional leaders, We're trying to train them on the conflict resolution and management at grassroots level, not at national level, but at grassroots level, to make sure that they can live peacefully. Since we have some huge IDPs moving in area, we expect that there is many conflict can arise with those autochthon who are there and those uh, new IDPs can be. That is the way we do. So on uh, at the development aspect, mostly, as I said, is multi-sectorial, and we focus mostly on um, aspect. One of them is mostly wood, uh, women economic empowerment, where we give a kind of microcredit for women to sustain in the, in the household to run a small business in order to kind of survive. The second one, we have uh, uh, SRH, sexual and reproductive health. Uh, mainly, we are focusing on family planning, where mostly it's uh, on community oriented and sensitizing uh, community, because as we'll see later, that uh, social norms and culturally is mostly a, a barrier to access uh, um, contraceptive in uh, DRC. I think we still uh, have the way to go. If we compare to neighbor country like Rwanda, where there are around 50 already, the contraceptive, more than contraceptive prevalence, around 50, we will still uh, struggling if you're around 16. And we understand of the challenge of Congo of conflict, and there's kind of half of a continent, this huge continent in uh, Congo. Yeah. So this, the third one, uh, I said the women economic uh, empowerment, I said the SRH, and the second one is mostly food security and uh, nutrition. We have a, a couple of activities doing on that to make sure that uh, people can have a small business uh, and having also food to ensure that they're having food at home. And, and women, kids are educated and where to prevent malnutrition. So the last one we have also on uh, working mostly on um, humanitarian aspect where we are intervening directly to give uh, uh, support to those who are uh, affected directly. And all this we use what we call engaging men. We think that everything is connected to men power. And um, this is the opportunity also to thank uh, the new leadership in Congo. As you know, uh, the new president, we had the election in 2018, the new president is mostly motivated and committed really to, to promote a kind of uh, uh, masculinity, positive masculinity. And even at national level, uh, has been created a, a fund which it will be moved with uh, supporting victims <coughs> of violence. And if we know as a man, we are most selfish sometimes. In power, in everything, we want to run alone and so on. So mostly, this is very important. Care use as an approach to um, to promote this kind of positive masculinity, so women can get access to economic uh, security, can get uh, contraceptive, can get uh, humanitarian, uh, and leading also in humanitarian sometimes. Yeah. That is what I can say. But nexus is important. One challenge on nexus, uh, I can say, is mostly uh, the intervention of partner are mostly pragmatic, fragmented because some partners they don't understand that nexus is so important. If they have uh, received the budget on uh, humanitarian, they want only to work in silo on humanitarian. Those who receive the donor on uh, donor support on uh, development, they want also to focus on development. But as then, all of us we are suffering because we didn't have this kind of sustainability of the, the, the program. So it's so important that uh, at donor level, they should know, should know that DRC, where the world has been for a decade, uh, we need really a nexus uh, approach in order to tackle some issue facing by the population.
Thank you so much, George. You you preempted every question I had, and um, I think that's really unfair. But um, I think what you've drawn is a very complex picture. I know that there are people waiting to ask you questions, and I know that you know want to open up the floor for the rest of you. But what I'm going to do, and I know that I've got questions for you, State Secretary, uh, leading on from George. But I want to move to you, and you are very familiar with. You were instrumental in establishing the program, program. And what I'd like you to do is draw us a bit back from where we started to where we are today. And a very difficult question to you is <laughs> what are you most proud of? And what would you have done differently? Yeah, thank you. Uh, but be before answering that question, I would just like to build on what George said and explain very briefly what coffee is because we have had several references to CAFI. So CAFI is a multi-donor a multi -donor initiative uh, founded in 2015. Nine donors, uh, including Norway, working in six different countries, or working with six different countries in Central <coughs> Africa, including DRC. And, and CAFI has a quite a broad objective, uh, so it's kind of the nexus that you refer to, and, and getting out of the silos. So we have a kind of a twin objective of reducing deforestation and promoting sustainable development. And we work in different sectors based on demands from, from national governments. So that's how we got involved in, in family planning. So family planning is just one of many different sectors that we support. And we only do it in DRC, not in the other five countries. And we are actually only working with promise. We don't have any other projects in the uh, uh, family planning sector. So about 10% of what we spend of, of the funding from the CAFI fund is going to, to, to POMI and family planning. So then back to your question, I think what um, we are really proud of is first that uh, the project got started very quickly. Uh, we have uh, different experiences with different partners and different sectors. But in case of for me and family planning, they really got started very quickly, started starting uh, 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 to, to generate results. And, and second, they have different approaches. So there are three different implementing partners with different approaches. So we are. It's very inter interesting to see how how you can have, have different approaches which are complementary, and which are all uh, uh, generating results. And then third, uh, the very. Uh, uh, um, important results focus of the program, the fact that they have increased their result delivery year by year, and as was, uh, was on the slide, that in 2022, POMI actually delivered 41% of the entire national contraceptive delivery, whatever you call it, in DRC. So this, this program is is delivering 41% of all the contraceptives in DRC, and DRC is the size of Western Europe. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a huge country with quite bad infrastructure. Uh, it's very difficult to work there, but in spite of all these challenges, this program is, 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 is really uh, uh, representing a, a lot of results. So I think, I think that is really something we are proud of. It's huge. Looking back, anything you would have done differently? Looking forward, moving forward, anything? How do you see your comments evolving from here? You could do both a back and a forward. Yeah, um, of course you can always do things differently, but looking, looking forward, I, I think what we now have to make sure is that the funding can be sustained, uh, because this is the fourth year of, of PROMIS, and it's ending this year, so we really have to make sure that the funding can be sustained. Uh, and we have to be able to mobilize additional funding. I don't think CAFI will be able to put very much more funding into the program than we are doing at present. Uh, because we have to have kind of a balance between different sectors. But of course, if CAFI is managing to mobilize more funding, that could possibly be, be done. But at least we should sustain the level of funding that we have had through the past four years. But then I really hope that we can mobilize additional funding from other donors, other uh, philanthropies, and, and even private uh, donors. So that's in 
that's an, an invitation to the premier implementing partners to really work on on resource uh, mobilization. Uh, yeah, I think that's the that's the challenge as I see it. Have have more impact, sustain the the, the results we have, and, and scale up because as we have seen, uh, there is so much more to do and the. Uh, the modern contraceptive prevalence rate, uh, which is basically how many use contraceptives, is still very low in DRC compared to other African countries. So there is still quite a lot to do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 You've heard about resource mobilization, the need to scale up. You yourself um, brought in the word unmet need initially from you know over 30 years ago. And young people actually. And I wanted to ask you, what do you like when you are responsible, you are one of the mo most um, people most responsible, and you are of course political leadership, how do you see two things? The resource mobilization, the importance of being able to scale up and working across with other partners, other donors. And the second thing, I'd love you to be able to talk a little bit about one of the biggest political decisions made um, most recently in terms of bridging the nexus and the development and humanitarian. Can I throw that at you, please? Absolutely. Now, the resources question is to put that into a larger global context as well. We are in, living in challenging times in terms of sexual reproductive health and rights and gender equality. And there's massive pushback that we're experiencing at the global stage. Um, Moran has helped us map as well the extent of funding and organization of these very well organized forces that are working systematically to dismantle the progress that we've made in this area. During COVID, these organizations became better organized. And we now see some of them opening country offices in some African countries with immediate impact on those governments' commitment or withdrawal of commitment to comprehensive sexuality education, to, to uh, other uh, sensitive issues uh, around reproductive health and reproductive rights. Um, this is in general. It's not, I mean, it's not so DRC related, but it impacts on the level of funding as well. Um, currently, uh, level of funding for these kinds of uh, activities globally is uh, at, I think, at a, a reasonable level, but it's, it's fragile. Uh, we've seen with changing administrations in the US, such an important donor to this field, that it's vulnerable, uh, it's vulnerable to changing politics. I mentioned that one country because they're such a big donor, and so it would make such a big impact if, if that country changes. But this is vulnerable to political changes, uh, other places as well. And that's one of the reasons why I mentioned that we are fortunate in a way that we have across parties a strong commitment to to this, and so it's important for us. Uh, as Norway to keep this very high on the agenda and to keep mobilizing <coughs> uh, other governments and other partners mm -hmm. to you know keep up funding and efforts in this in this particular uh, area um, and on the nexus so this is I think anyone who's worked in development for some time knows that we've been talking about this for a very long time and struggled to find ways to bridge those uh, silos between the humanitarian, the long-term development, and now we have the triple nexus with the peace uh, aspect as well. So at home, and those, those of you who work here in Norway will know that we've made some organizational changes in our own setup to break down the silos internally in the way that we are organized so that the management of the humanitarian support will be managed together with long-term financing here in Norway. And sorry, you ignore it. <laughs> and, um, and so we need to manage that very carefully so that we don't lose the flexibility and speed uh, of the humanitarian support, but are better able to, to see these uh, better linked together so that our partners on the ground 
don't run into the problems. I think you described them very well <laughs> in that, you know, as you're working on the ground, you see a need, but your money is humanitarian, so you can only spend it for this part of, of what you see, and then you have this funding here that you can spend on that part, but you, but you, what you want to do on the ground is to link this better together. So I, our, our aim with making these changes is that to enable that uh, more coherent effort on the ground, in particular as we see that crises are last for a very long time. In, in the situation of protracted crises, we need to, to set ourselves up so that we can address uh, the real needs on the ground. But we're going to need, you know, everyone in this room <laughs> and other partners as well to make sure that we set this up uh, right. Thank you so much. And I think that was a very good way of also bringing in all of you. I'm going to ask Julie a quick question. I'm going to hand over to you and I'd love to see some of you raising your hands and let me know who you are so that I can pass the floor on to you. But Julie, first of all, I mean, I'm still really an amazing presentation. So... Let me ask you a very easy question. Connect the dots for us when you talk about education and family planning. Um, the main reason why girls are dropping out of school, the main reasons why uh, girls aren't getting an, an education in sub-Saharan Africa is because they're getting pregnant at 13, 14, 15, 16. And from there on, their life course is out of, uh, with almost no chance of catching up. So that's, that's a very short answer. Uh, there is, of course, if you think long term, if you think about the SDGs, uh, if you invest in girls, uh, you have better chance of diversifying your economies, you give them more chances for investments. Uh, why would you deprive, why would a country deprive itself of half of its workforce, productive forces, and perhaps some of the strongest people in this country? So that's, uh, that's the short answer between, and that's only possible if girls don't have their first child at 16. Uh, that's incredibly important. So that's a very short answer. Oh, that's very impressive. And I know that I'm going to, you know, just hand over. But you've heard a range. You've had a range of information thrown at you this morning. There are so many bits and pieces that we could sit and unpack to get there, and that we could discuss. And it would be great to have a but we don't have time. But we do have the opportunity to build on what you've been said so far today. So can I just have your hands raised for those of you who have, as we could say in Norwegian, burning questions? Please don't. Self-imposed. Um, we are going to start off with Ingvar, to my right, and then Felicia, and then we have Chief Sergeant, that's correct. We've got, we'll start with you, and then if you'd like to indicate who this is addressed, whether it's the, you know, everyone here, and if we have the first row included, try and be short and to the point, which I know is a great yeah. problem. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay, my name is Ingvar Theos, and I work here in the Global Health section, and I've been following this from the very sideline uh, for a long time, and it's very, very interesting to have this opportunity to, to listen to you. So my question is related to uh, to the you know the, the overall approach in in um, in um, DRC because you you talk about the fragile healthcare system and and uh, the, the emphasis on frontline. Uh, sort of uh, delivery of, of this. And uh, I'm, I'm sort of trying to see how dependent it, uh, it is at the, at the current setup on the overall healthcare system to be able to sustain this over time. Because if you have uh, this strong focus on this front line uh, that is sort of semi-detached from the system, it seems, uh, maybe I misunderstood it. So if you could say a few words to that. I don't know who could best answer that, so I'm not able to address it to one of you particularly. Should we collect two more questions before we start addressing them? Can I pass on to you? Here comes the mic, please, Victor. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Uh, my name is uh, Frederik Kikilander, and I just joined the forest section in NORAD. And before that, I worked 10 years with the civil society section, and before that, with CARE Norway on gender equality. So <laughs> I really love how this seminar brings together like multi-sectoral approach and so many of the things we, we, we work for. Um, I, I think uh, the state secretary started by mentioning the risk of human rights violations in the name of population control. Uh, and always when the headline is sort of environment, and we are to speak about family planning, I always get a bit, bit anxious, so, uh, but, but I think you, you frame this uh, very well. But I was curious if you could say something uh, from the side of the PROMI project. How have you worked on like risk mitigation 
uh, to make sure that you, uh, the principle of rights, uh, bodily autonomy, choice uh, is, is well you know, taken care of in the project as it's under the, the coffee headline. Thank you. Thank you, and then we'll just take one last question and then we'll yeah. start answering them. Yeah, my name is Haldis Korsha. I'm a senior advisor for health in Norwegian Church Aid, who's working in 23 countries in Africa, mainly. And we have uh, currently made a family <coughs> planning toolkit for healthcare providers, who is in a way um, summing up um, the World Health Organization's big uh, uh, family planning toolkit uh, into five days training. And we have tested it in, in two countries. We are tested in Malawi at um, Tanzania at Haydom Electron Hospital. And uh, what we have done uh, during the pilot is to, to um, uh, uh, reorganize, reorganize the training because we saw that uh, value clarification was quite important because we are training already uh, trained health workers, but there were so many myths and misconceptions among the already trained nurses and midwives that we trained that we have to change the, the, the outline of the, the toolkit. And that brings me to your um, training of uh, 13,000 community workers. Uh, how are you addressing uh, the, the myths and the misconceptions they have uh, regarding giving, for instance, uh, um, contraceptives to adolescents who are not married, and so on. So that would be interesting to, to listen to. Thank you. Thank you. Julie, shall we start? You seem to be nodding both at one and three. <laughs> so can you... Yes. Um, I'll, I'll go to, to one. I think in the last... Um, thank you for your questions, first of all. Um, in the last uh, slide, when we were mentioning, second to last, we were mentioning challenges, uh, we were mentioning all the asks we're getting from the government. We're getting all those asks because we're working very closely with them. Uh, we have purposefully tried not to be one of those NGOs that parachutes into a country, creates a project, and they will leave. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's gone. Uh, and believe me, that was not the easy choice uh, because Working very closely with the government of PRC means you're being asked a lot uh, for a lot of support. Uh, you need everything you do to align with national policies, with governance documents, with guidelines. And that is one of our efforts, uh, mostly thanks to our and heroes, working very, very closely with the government. On top of that, the community health workers, they're part of the government. That's a national policy, that's in the national strategy plan, that community-based distribution should be a national strategy. Uh, the students in particular are all operating, all nursing schools in the DRC are operating in their one direction, the direction for teaching health sciences, which is hosted at the Ministry of Health. And this is all done with the buy-in of the Ministry of Health, to the point that this FP curriculum nowadays is part of the official curriculum in the DRC. Uh, in terms of data reporting, we have made sure uh, that all of the data that is uh, being produced, all the statistics that are being produced by those students is reported in the uh, NHA, NHA, National Health Information System, which in DRC uses the DHIS2, thank you to the University of Oslo for coming up with this one, it's brilliant. Uh, and uh, those service statistics, when we started, there was no module for community health, uh, community-based services, there was no module for social marketing, and one of the efforts that we're leading through for me is to have uh, created this community-based uh, module in the DHIS2, which now exists, and we're currently working on the one for the private sector and social marketing. Uh, so we have very strong government buy-in, strong government alignment. Oh, Arsene, did I forget the his name? On the, no? Okay. Uh, and then uh, regarding the, the value clarification, uh, and the myths and how those, and that touches, I feel, a little bit upon the, uh, the rights question as well. Uh, we've said all of the family planning we produce, all of the, the contraceptive uh, methods we offer are based on uh, voluntary choices. Uh, the women have presented the full range of methods. Of course, it's very easy to say that. Uh, nobody's going to check you in country that that's what you're doing. But we do believe um, DRC is a country that has immense need and we are really just blocking the low-hanging fruit here. The women who show up at our campaigns, our community-based events, are desperate. 
for contraception. We don't have to force it on them. We are not at that stage there where you need to thread a fine line between somebody who would be interested in it maybe, or you would have to do a little bit of convincing. We're really plucking the low hanging fruits of those women who are either young and want to continue their education, uh, or those women who are 32, they're on their sixth kid, and they think the sevens might kill them. So that's, that's the population that we're working with. And in terms of value clarification, yes, we don't free the minds and soul of our community health workers. But one of the benefits, uh, particularly of the Tulane model using nursing school students, is that uh, we train them at an age, they're 15, 16, we train them at an age where they receive a ton of information. And they receive this information from family planning now, before those myths and misconceptions have time to really take roots. Uh, and we found that to be very enthusiastic, and if you uh, want, it's a little bit anecdotal, but uh, interesting indicator of how enthusiastic they are about it, uh, one of our favorite outcome is that unwanted pregnancy rates have decreased in the schools themselves, because the students themselves have been exposed to those methods uh, and are interested in um, having that freedom that access to contraception gives you. So, sorry, I was trying to answer a lot of questions. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. And I think that brings us very, very nicely to the question that you've raised, Frederick, in terms of, you know, the, right, the rights and risks. And I'm wondering, State Secretary, if I could ask you to answer that. And also, if you had any reflections you wanted to share with us from what you've heard today, whether it be from presentations or anything so far. And if there's anything you'd like to challenge us with before you leave, because I know that you have to be on your way soon. You don't have to challenge us. We, we, <laughs> we, we see plenty of those every day, but <laughs> feel free. No, thank you. Um, and thanks, uh, Felix, also for raising. I think it's really important that we are very conscious and, and aware of the rights aspect. And it's very, very high up and very, very clear in the Norwegian political position around, around um, sexual reproductive health and rights. We always add the and rights although it's a bit sensitive in the global discussion. Um, so I, in, in preparing for, well, for the meeting today, World Contraception Day, there are a number of events coming up since the 30 years since Cairo. I have been thinking back uh, to the discussions that we have had, and we are not there now. So when I mentioned you know, the rights uh, violations that happened in the name of population control or even in the name of you know, saving uh, our planet, and it's a discussion that was, I think, higher on the agenda at the time. And then the Cairo conference came as a watershed that really placed rights, bodily autonomy, gender equality, firmly on that agenda. And I, and I think it has remained there. I don't think we can take it for granted. But I think you know, um, discussions that we are having, discussions that are happening also in within the environmental movements and the, and the people working on uh, addressing uh, climate change, I, I feel there is an awareness there that we will not you know, slip back into the days, those days of um, of uh, population uh, control and those horrible human rights abuses. But I don't think we can take anything for granted. So I don't think we'll slip back uh, because of of uh, you know, discussions in the climate or environmental movement. But the pushback that we are seeing is more around a pushback on, on gender equality, not from the environmental people, but from, from other, I don't know, conservative forces. Um, that are very strong. And so maybe my, my just last challenge <laughs> is that we don't take what we have achieved and the progress that we've made for granted, that we need to keep pushing the politically the rights agenda and the good services we link to, to the political discussion. We need to make sure that the good work that, that you are, are doing in making, making products and information and those choices available to the people that we are talking about is so uh, important. So that's a big challenge to all of us. Thank you so much. Do you need anything else? Well, the time is it? We're around 11.51. Um, sorry, that means I have to leave. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I listen to your comments as I slip out. But thank you very much. Can we just say <laughs> thank you for coming and, and sharing your reflections? I know that you have a reflection you wanted to share. Yeah, yeah just on the question from Patricia on, on risk mitigation, uh, just from our perspective as, as donors, first, uh, what's the uh, narrative we have, what's the concepts and what's the word, words that we use? So we, we really focus on, on, uh, on the rights-based approach, 
and, uh, and we do not use words as birth control or population control. That, that, that is anything that, that can give you an impression of coercion is, is, is totally uh, out of our language. We don't use that. And then I think what we can do as donors is to pick good partners. Uh, there are some conservation organizations uh, do, doing, uh, or piloting, I would say, uh, uh, family planning. And what I've heard is that they are doing it according to the book. But we have decided to work with professional uh, uh, family planning uh, organizations like Tulane, like uh, MSI, like DKT. And we expect them to, to really do this 110% uh, in accordance with a rights-based uh, approach. So, so that's how we, we address uh, that, that concern. And then I also have a reflection on the question about, <coughs> but I could come back to it, but I think it's a very interesting discussion about working with international NGOs or working with, uh, um, with the government or, or a mixture, uh, and, and the fact that we see very pressing needs requiring uh, uh, urgent responses, and then at the same time we know that in the longer term uh, you will have to build uh, institutions and local capacities. So how do we uh, address that dilemma of, of, of wanting to have uh, results uh, quite immediately and, and at the same time build something uh, long-lasting? Uh, and we are in a region with very weak uh, government and, and public capacity uh, where the uh, government budget uh, going to the health sector is is extremely low and very underfinanced and uh, I mean DRC uh, has had a budget of the size of Oslo so Oslo is a small city in Europe and Oslo has had the same resources as the national government in DRC and then the funding flowing to the soft sectors like agriculture and health and, and environment and so on is really very little and the budget that is being approved by the government <coughs> is not executed. So maybe only 10% of what the parliament is allocating to these sectors is then executed uh, because there are pressing needs in other sectors. Um, um, so how do you work with um, with public sectors and governments where there is really weak capacity and where there are pressing needs. That's a, a, it's, it's a dilemma that we could discuss for, for, for long. Thank you so much, Yusuf. And that really brings perspective and, and you've really lifted up, again, those constant dilemmas that we're seeing in these, these interactions today. I see that we have at least one more question in the audience. There are none online, as far as I can tell. But can I give you the mic? And we'll take the last round of questions before we start wrapping up. Thank you. My name is Ivo Boer. I'm working for Focus, a small NGO. Um, however, I was uh, consulted as a consultant, I think, in the startup phase of the uh, project. And I was wondering if you could say a bit more about why a forest initiative is involved in this. This may not be clear for everyone. Uh, and then if I remember right, it's the, the rationale was that uh, poverty uh, and uh, population <coughs> growth is a uh, factor in deforestation, right? So there was a hope that the reduced poverty and reduced population growth would help uh, limit uh, deforestation. Perhaps you could say more about that. And if and whether you are actually monitoring if there is any effect on deforestation coming out of uh, reduced fertility, <laughs> may be difficult at this uh, stage. But then, uh, second question is, uh, if you could say a little bit more about how you address the uh, demand side. You say that women are desperate for contraception, but I guess many still hesitate or <coughs> are actually opposed to contraception for various reasons. Some believe it's dangerous, others believe it's not a proper thing to do. So if you could say a little bit more about that, thank you. Thank you. Right. Do we have any other questions? We do. We have two more here. So hold on, chat. You'll stay. You need to remember. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad you divide that between us. Over to you. Uh, I'm Sarah Tai. I'm from Sexy Boutique, which is IPBF Norway. Um, I just wanted to ask because you mentioned that um, only about 10% of the funding that you have goes to family planning, and that you're only implementing it in. Uh, in Congo, and I wanted to ask if you see any possibilities of upscaling and kind of 
and doing the work that you're doing in Congo, replicating that to the other countries that you're present in. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tia, working on the section for forests. A um, bit of, not sure if it's a question or a reflection, but also you talked about the sustainability of the results, and I was wondering, you know, good to see that you're working with the government, but also whether you're tackling the economic possibility of access when you said 96% of the population is living on less than $2 a day, um, you know, once you know, hopefully not, the program would eventually disappear or be scaled down or up, you know, how women would access um, on their, with their own means or, what, you know, uh, contraception. Um, I think that's a risk. It might be interesting to hear thoughts on that as well. Thank you so much. I don't think we've got anything online. We do not have anything online. And with that, I'm going to start with you. Georges, I want you to also reflect on the unmet needs and then particularly in terms of the DRC's point of view in terms of scalability, because it's not just about other partners, it's about what the national government wants to do, and if you could speak to that. And with that, I hand over to you. Uh, uh, thank you. So first, um, you, asked, you asked about uh, why forest initiative investing in in family planning. So, uh, as I said, we had quite a, a broad uh, a, a goal, uh, and we um, we invest according to national investment plans. And these national investment plans are based on uh, on deforestation driver studies. And in case of DRC, there was a national uh, driver study uh, done back in 2010, uh, very broad with with uh, Lots of consultations, different uh, organizations involved, UNDP, UNEP, and, and national civil society, uh, and also with support from different universities. And, and, and one of the conclusions from that uh, uh, driver study was that, uh, as opposed to deforestation in Brazil and in, in, in Indonesia, where deforestation is very much linked to industrial uh, agriculture in Brazil is soya, it's, it's uh, cattle, and in Indonesia it's palm oil. In DRC, deforestation is caused by slash and burn agriculture uh, undertaken by millions of, of small farmers, small, of small scale farmers. There isn't much, if any, industrial agriculture in, in DRC. So it's all about uh, Small scale slash and burn uh, agriculture and around the cities, uh, charcoal production. Like in DRC, 95% uh, of people they use charcoal uh, to, to <coughs> for cooking because they do not have access to reliable electricity. Uh, so it's a totally different situation <coughs> from other countries. Uh, uh, so it's, it's not a question of industrial drivers, but, but non-industrial uh, uh, drivers. And according to this driver study, the underlying cause is poverty and demographic pressure. And as I think was said in, uh, by, by Tulane, uh, according to, to UN, DRC is actually one of the countries worldwide with the highest population growth. Uh, uh, it's it, it, towards 2050. It's the country with the fourth highest population growth in millions, and it's going to become the sixth most uh, populous country in 2100, according to the UN, uh, according to the, what is called the middle scenario. So it could be much worse, and it could be better. But so we are talking about a quadrupling uh, uh, of the population from 100 million to 400 million. So this is uh, why the government uh, and in why they asked the CAFE to have uh, family planning and demography as part of the uh, uh, portfolio, and the uh, uh, and that's why it's it's in the national investment plan. Um, so then, to to your question, why don't we do it in other countries? Well, it's it's for the same reason that the governments have not asked us to do it. Uh, uh, personally, I think it could make sense to do it in Cameroon, uh, which is in, in a somewhat similar situation and also the Central African Republic. Uh, but as long as we don't have the requests, we, 
we will not do it. We will, we will, we are working in, in close partnership with national governments, and, and we are basing our investments on national investment plans. So, so that's why we do it in DRC and why we have not yet done it in, in other countries. But I'm not excluding it, but it will have to be uh, based on a, on a national request. Um, on the demand side, quite a question and demand side barriers. So we have until tomorrow morning, right, to stay here. Um, so thank you for your question. Uh, it's interesting because we've been asked uh, a lot about the churches, about men in positions, uh, and we've always answered those are not the big barriers. Uh, churches, churches we've worked with uh, very closely since 2014, uh, and not all of them are really in favor. Some of them authorize the so-called natural methods, others permit everything, others just don't want to hear about it, but they don't really stand in our way in the way that it happens in other countries. Men, generationally, is changing, and it's also changing because the economic conditions are changing. Many men migrate to cities, and raising six kids in the cities is way more expensive than raising six kids in the countryside. Um, so, very broad brush here. Uh, the demand side on the side of women. You're right that uh, it's not every woman who's desperate for contraceptive. A lot of them are. A lot of you have to think about the RC as ground zero. Uh, a lot of women are learning for the first time that there is a way to control your fertility at those campaigns that we organize. So this is really where we're starting from here. This being said, uh, sometimes the issue is not so much with acceptance but with continuation. And part of it is because of side effects. Uh, the state secretary mentioned that. Um, any contraceptive method is going to mess up the modern one, the hormonal one, is going to mess up your cycle for a couple of months. And women in DRC, which, who have very, very little uh, biological literacy and, and sexual health literacy, see this as this is adversely affecting my fertility. Absolutely not specific to DRC. You hear that throughout Sub Saharan Africa. Um, and so that is a huge issue, and that is something that can be addressed uh, through provider training not just listing side effects, but also reassuring women that those side effects are non-threatening to their future fertility. Uh, you also have the slew of myth around, you know, the alcohol will give you cancer, and countless TikTok videos about how they're going to get lost in your body and going to choke on them. Those are a little bit harder to address, but the concern over your fertility is, is a big one. Uh, in a country where there's not a lot of CSC, in a country where there's not a lot of that biological, literacy and in a country where there's a high social premium on motherhood, which means that women would rather risk an unwanted pregnancy now rather than risk their future fertility because that is, for a lot of them, the only social value they might find. Again, we're getting back to our education. And ultimately, this is a gender equity uh, question, and this, this needs to be approached through gender equity uh, lens. And that's also a fine line for us to think about uh, because if a woman wants to be a mother, and if she wants to be a mother of three or four kids, of course that's her rights. But if that's the only choice that will give her, give her any social value, then we have a motherhood injunction that's uh, ultimately uh, damaging to her empowerment and her freedom of choice. Julie, it's going to be very yeah, quick. <laughs> I just forgot to say to you and um, to all of you that uh, I told you where we are coming from. Why are we financing this? But I also have to say that uh, the narrative that we are encouraging is really a much broader narrative because this project has multiple benefits and it's impacting all the major development goals. So we do not have. A, a forest narrative on this when in our discussions with whatever partners we have because we think it's important to focus on the much broader benefits of this uh, for, for the DRC. So I just wanted to, to clarify that. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Can we hand over to up there? Yeah. Oh, just want to, uh, sorry, Josh. Yeah, well, I don't know what to say. But I think uh, one of the challenges in uh, contraceptive in Congo is still, um, as uh, my <coughs> colleague said, is still mostly challenging in terms of women. There have been uh, many research showing that men and women in Congo, they need more kids to position themselves to have a status in society. So that is where education has to lie there, and we have to focus more on educating them to show that is not the point. That is a big, big, big challenge. Uh, another challenge we have was uh, mostly about government. 
there is no system, uh, I can say, to, because the government lack a kind of ownership. They are uh, mostly counting on a partner, and then we don't have sustainability. And then if the UNFPA is there or PROMIS is there, they want them to perform everything. Uh, for example, uh, 2022, I think their budget, it was uh, under 3.5% uh, dedicated to health. So we can understand how much is so small So to address all those issues. So for them, they lie on w, WFP, they lie on UNFPA, they lie on World Bank to say, you are going to support this. But those partners, they will leave one day, and then who will continue the system? Because really, the system is so fragile. And um, I, one question maybe we have to tackle here on family planning, since it's the day of family planning, is mostly on a uh, stock out of product, where really there is no stock out. Uh, um, when you come to those who have been educated, uh, rising awareness, and then they want the services, you don't meet it. You find, for example, there is no that availability of the product also. So it's still, uh, I think, an issue because the system, I'm happy to hear that. Um, they are putting this kind of warehouse uh, mostly to support, but it should be sustainable if the government is taking a kind of ownership, not partners. Yeah, that was what I say. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, George. I want to give the last word to you, Arsene. You know I'm going to ask you to <coughs> help us conclude. So I'll try to bid on what uh, my, my uh, is from Congo. No. <laughs> <laughs> we are all from Congo. <laughs> When we are talking about sustainability and ownership uh, on the side of the government, it's very important to know that the annual budget for the country, the really the money that they are, they are, <clears throat> they are managing for this year probably won't reach six billion. To solve all the problems, we have war in the East, we have this coming election. We have also a uh, discussion around building the country, discussion about what the president is saying, like free education for all. Who is going to pay that? Now they just launch a free delivery for all women. Who is going to pay that? They have only less than one billion for, for uh, F, less than maybe Eight million. So with less than eight million for health, we don't. We we all know that uh, we have HIV, we have a vaccine, we have, we have nutrition. All those components are priorities for the country. So we are fighting to try to get some money from the government. Maybe three three months ago. What happened was uh, very shocking for everyone. The government was not able to pay salary for workers. So they went to the bank and get some money to pay functionaire. That time, it was very impossible to go and say, please, can you give us money for family planning, for vaccine, for, you know. It is, this is what it is, not only in Congo, but in most of the country. I've been, I was in, a, in Cameroon, we the same, sorry, in Chad, the same. So this time, probably the near future too, we need you. We need money coming from donors. We know so donors working with the government on how they can make their own money they can increase the na uh, national budget. This is a big deal. One of the ministers in our country, he was Minister of uh, F, let's say, first, uh, before which one, uh, that one, the governor of uh, Kinshasa <coughs> was saying these things, F problems. Don't come with those problems to me. Go and see donors. This is one. Then one day, Minister of Health, National Minister of Health said, donors, international NGOs, 
won't never leave Africa because they know all that we need them. We work together and we don't know for how long, but as, as long as we do have problems, we need them and they know that. So this is a very, very big problem, discussion to continue, Absolutely. not to start, to continue. And with that, I have the very difficult job of trying to... Oh, sorry, Josh, you wanted uh, just... One thing I wanted to re reflect on, uh, not about my compatriot, what he said, but mostly on uh, Kafi, because I, uh, Joa was uh, touching it on mostly on uh, poverty and so on. I, I know, and when, when I'm linking with what my colleague said here, yes, we, the, we, the government count on partner, external contribution but also if you see how much money we are losing in corruption and that's why I'm saying because I see Kathy having one portfolio on governance and it's important that people touch that one billion of money is losing in DRC in corruption and no one is going in jail and, and no one is being punished on that one so I mean yes the international community can do something but at least we need also kind of leadership, governance, good governance to make sure that those corruption has been reduced. I, I worked myself in around the 11 countries in Africa. Corruption is everywhere. So it's becoming a sickness, uh, or what I can say. But at least to show kind of initiative uh, or kind of, uh, yeah, on uh, addressing corruption. Yes, they have an initiative today in Congo with uh, leaders who is uh, the no, just a serious level of denouncing, this has been taken this money and so on, but uh, tracking them to, to court is still an issue. Yeah, that's what I would say. Let yeah, me use one point. And <laughs> 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 after this, I am I'm confiscating the yeah. mic. <laughs> so maybe it is very important to know that the government is doing what they can do, yeah. even if uh, we have uh, corruption. They are working on... Um, local resource mobilization. These have been coming from different parties, from donors, from uh, national NGOs. If we can at least mobilize funds from private sector. Yes, corruption is there, but if you can help us work with the government, work with uh, organization and private sector, if they can invest in what they say, social responsibility, and invest that money in uh, in earth, for example, in peace. This is also something. Uh, you see how I came to take it in there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but that was a very important point to make. So I'm very glad you got the last word on that. I have the very difficult job of trying to like in some way wrap wrap this up that makes it makes any sense. And first of all, I just want to say congratulations to Tulane for the you know you've met all your you've met all your results to. So, you know, that's, that's incredible. I, I'm going to take the State Secretary's word on the fact that we all need to come together in order to push with rigour and vigour this agenda forward. It is all about human rights. It is all about gender equality. It is about everything that is at stake. It is about the Sustainable Development Goals. We all make a difference. It has to be multi-sectoral. It has to be multi-partner. I am going to thank Georges, Julie, Moustain, Arsène and Jane and, and, and well, State Secretary for coming here today, from coming from near and far to everyone in this room for being here and for adding value to the work that is being done. And I also have to wrap up by saying a big thank you to the Nora team that worked across sectors to make this day happen. Thank you so much because we wouldn't be here without the rest of you. Thank you so much.